Today, our focus will be on eco-socialism and our guests are Derek Wall uh, from Britain and Stefania Barca from Portugal, but she's traveling right now. So um, um, let me first briefly introduce Polen Ecology um, to those encountering it for the first time. Uh, Polen Ecology is a collective set out with a Marxist perspective to contribute to the development of Marxist ecological awareness, both in the ecological movement and in the socialist movement. Polen Ecology aims to promote international Marxist ecological literature and develop partnerships with movements in other countries. In line with the needs of the struggle, it aims to develop a new, new organizations, platforms, and to create an ecological movement in which rural and urban toilers, workers, and the oppressed, and especially women and young people become subjects and leaders. As Polen Ecology, we invite everyone to join our collective who considers that the ecological struggle should be part of the struggle for social liberation against capitalism and that it should be organized in a way that will spread to all of it and who want to be involved in the development and implementation of a new program and strategy in this direction. So before we start, let me also very briefly introduce our speakers today. Stefania Basha is a senior researcher at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. Her work encompasses fields such as economic history, environmental history, ecological economics, and political ecology. And her research particularly focuses on the critique of the Anthropocene as a framework and the relationship between labor and environment, environmental justice, degrowth, and commoning. She is the author of many books, the most recent one being Forces of Reproduction. Derek Wall teaches at Goldsmiths, University of London. His research interests include radical and green political economy, social movement theory, Marxism, and particularly the history and role of commons in environmental struggles. He is the author of several books, including The Commons in History, The Sustainable Economics of Eleanor Ostrom, and most recently, Climate Strike, The Practical Politics of the Climate Crisis. Let me also, right at the beginning, extend our gratitude to the interpreters, because usually at the end of events, we forget to do so. Uh, today, Bahadur, uh, Muge, and Barish uh, are the invisible heroes of our event, so many thanks to them as well. So, um, Derek and Stefania, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the title of today's seminar is Ecosocialism. But before we contemplate an eco-socialist society, let's start by talking about the struggle for it and the transition to it. Um, I want to take a point of departure, a point Stefania has raised in one of her writings. In the discussion between Yorgos Kallis and John Bellamy Foster, both come up with certain proposals to mobilize the general public under present conditions here and now. Stefania, you emphasize the need to engage in a more concrete analysis instead of presupposing a general public and raise the question of subjectivities and subjectivation. And Derek, I know you mull over these issues a lot, um, especially the concept of base building or practical community militancy, building dense networks committed to a radical change. Could you both please reflect on this question, on the question of subjects and subjectivation, outlining your main positions, pointing to possible pitfalls and so forth. And also please feel free to reflect on each other's answers, make it more conversational. So whoever wants to start first can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I don't know, can you hear me? Because I am uh, moving, so it could be that uh, my connection uh, fails at some point and uh, hopefully I can reconnect. Uh, well, thanks for starting. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to this debate. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have this conversation with Derek, whose uh, work I know, of course, but I've never had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, you. Uh, on screen, <laughs> and I, I'm not even mentioning in person. Um, so, uh, well, thanks for also for uh, starting this conversation for uh, uh, from uh, the the point uh, that you mentioned on the, the the general public issue. I think this is a this is something that uh, we need to discuss as. Um, 
uh, anyone in the in the ecology movement, particularly, uh, needs to discuss this, to unpack this this notion of a general public, and uh, start thinking about who is the ecological subject, because uh, for a long time, uh, especially in Western Europe, we were. Um, uh thinking of when we're thinking of the ecological subject we were imagining actually uh a specific uh, uh social class the um the white middle classes of uh, of western europe in their um, um ecological consciousness uh, and uh, by which most of us were thinking about consumerism and and you know, consciousness of the ecological impact of, uh, of consumerism and and um, and efforts at making that uh, greener, and to efforts at uh, discussing uh, energy uh, consumption and all uh, related uh, and uh, nuclear, for example. No? all the moments that were uh, defining the. Uh, the the image we all had of what environmentalism was all about, no? But um, I'm not going to dismiss all this. I, this is not my intention. I think this was very important. In fact, I, um, I myself uh, uh, did some research, historical research, on um, crisscrossing between uh, anti-nuclear movement and environmental movements in, in the 1970s and 80s in Western Europe and how important and defining it was that moment, that particular moment uh, for uh, the emergence of environmentalism. Uh, but I, what, what, to me, what is important that is that we understand that that is not environmentalism as such. That is one particular kind of environmentalism and there are others. And environmentalism, it's, uh, it's much larger, it's much broader than that. And there are different ecological subjects in it. Uh, for example, uh, the environmental justice movement uh, taught us that um, African-American communities, um, um, uh, mostly uh, living in, uh, in um, uh, in the outskirts of urban industrial, uh, um, the, the, the urban industrial uh, United States uh, are ecological subjects uh, because they are uh, targeted, specifically targeted uh, for the placement of uh, waste uh, incinerators, waste landfills, and all kinds of polluting um, and unwanted facilities. No? Uh, so, and the environmental justice movement uh, has made a point very strongly about uh, um, introducing the justice element in environmentalism and, and making environmentalism also a question of equality and of an anti-discrimination um, movement. Um, as, uh, likewise, the ecofeminist uh, movement has made a point about a certain uh, specific forms of environmental mobilization having to do with sex and gender, with the sexual division of labor, with the fact of uh, uh, the fact that uh, um, most reproductive and care work is uh, socially um, assigned to women and uh, and specifically to working class women, to proletarian women to racialized women, to those women who cannot afford to pay for somebody else to do reproductive and care work. And so the, the, the eco-feminist movement has made a point of the fact of these being a class, these uh, women being part of the working class and the, uh, in their own terms, uh, not the, the working class as we normally uh, imagine it. No? Uh, but uh, of, um, and so of these women having their own um, uh, their own concerns uh, about uh, ecology and as related to reproductive work as being the condition for reproductive work and the condition for the reproduction of life 
in general, human and non-human life. So, I mean, there are different kinds of the ecological subjects and subjectivities, and it is really important to, um, uh, to understand that when we talk about environmental politics, because politics needs um, uh, the identification of who is the political subject, no? and not just assume there is, there is a, general, a general we, uh, which is also from a Marxist point of view, it's a very basic, uh, very essential, uh, fundamental uh, point. So I don't want to take too much time. So, but maybe I will pass it on to Derek now. But maybe later on, uh, I think uh, I would like to talk about specifically the working class uh, as an ecological subject. Um, yeah, I, I certainly agree with all of that. And I hadn't followed the precise debate with John Bellamy Foster, as I'm aware of, of a lot of his work. Um, but yeah, of course, if we just have the public generality, that isn't how you achieve political change. Um, I mean, I don't really do anything. I mean, my main thing is just to point and say to people, read more Lenin and read more Ellen Rostrum. It's very different figures, but I think very productive. Um, so obviously, I think one thing that has, has kind of come up is working class agency. Um, and that obviously isn't the whole of it, but ecological problems, you know, one element of it is manufacture and production of energy. Um, and it can be very frustrating when you have groups like Extinction Rebellion, who do a lot of good, where they're saying, we'll have a systems assembly and we'll impose these policies and then workers have to implement the policies and the workers can look invisible. So though it isn't the only dimension, that element of working class, um, you know, is, is, is extremely important. So to give you two examples where this plays out, um, though it's not identical to my politics, I've been really impressed by Alan Thornett I have disagreements with, who um, is associated with Socialist Resistance, who are the kind of uh, group around the Fourth International in Britain, the Mandel Fourth International. And he's the most passionate person I've ever met on ecology. And he's a working class guy, he's now in his 80s, and he worked most of his life as a shop steward at Cowley Motor Works in Oxford, and he's very passionate about ecology. Um, you know, obviously these elements where you've had like the green ban movement in Australia, if people are familiar with that, with trade unions um, refusing to build things that were anti-ecological, um, you know, ecological justice, um, you know, and things like just transition, they can't just be a slogan, it's got to be the workers producing. And another kind of manifestation of that, I'm, I mean, I'm involved with, or I like to be involved in revolutionary politics, I don't know anybody in Britain really is, we've not been great at producing revolution, but I'm also interested in practical reform, so I'm a local councillor, and on our parish council, the very lowest level of British government, we, we do climate work, and the start with our climate work is to say to all of the staff who look after the grounds, what, what do you want to do ecologically? So I think that element is kind of missed. Um, I mean, another thing that was mentioned, base building, so particularly with the, you know, the, the problems in, in England, I mean, there's more stuff happening in the north of Ireland than Scotland and Wales, but in England, um, with things like kind of Jeremy Corbyn, you've got hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people who want political change. Um, and neither the Labour Party nor the traditional revolutionary left seem to be effective vehicles. So the base building, which I could talk about maybe a little bit later, that may be a way of like building capacity to, to build towards a kind of revolutionary politics. And it might be sort of building too much into this, but I, I would throw in Ellen Rostrum. I don't know how familiar people are with Ellen Rostrum, but she won a Nobel Prize in economics for her work on the commons. And in many ways is somebody who's kind of come from the right, but is a very powerful and precise figure. And I think some of her stuff, she emphasizes building trust and cooperation. So if you wanna build organizations and you wanna co-produce the future and you wanna mobilize, 
you've got to look at how you, on the absolutely micro level, build trust with others and talk to others. So the, the base building concept, which I could talk more, you know, that's a way, you know, maybe your politics talks, it starts with talking to your neighbours and building that trust. Okay, I think this is a perfect point to dig a little deeper into this. So in a way, we're all convinced that class is a central subject in this transition. Um, and of course, in all its intersections and intertwined nature with race and gender, yeah. and ethnicity and so forth. Um, I still see some commentators find the concept of class limiting because what they understand under the term of class is white industrial wage workers. Yes. I don't think any serious Marxist today sticks with this sort of a definition of class, but let's let's talk about this. Um, uh, so what class concept do you have in mind? And what is the role of class within the broader context of adapting to ecological breakdown and at the same time pushing for an all embracing social change? And maybe one more follow up with this question, how do you approach wage and non-wage labors in this context and how in, in, in the way they pertain to the concept of class? And of course, the spheres of production and social reproduction. Mm -hmm. So Stefania, if you like, we can again start with you. Thanks, those are very good questions. I wish I had the answers to some of them, but I can share with you what is my approach that issue because that is of course the key um, issue um, and I'm not I, I, I've been um, writing about this uh, for a while now by um, in, inspired by the feminist uh, literature specifically by Marxist feminism and feminist political economy uh, more broadly because uh, this um, area of, uh, of uh, thinking and, uh, and political praxis has taught us that labor is much broader and larger than the traditional uh, uh, concept of uh, the, the, the white blue, the, the, the, the blue collar uh, uh, worker, no? the industrial uh, wage uh, worker. That is only one part, uh, a small part actually, of the world working classes. Yeah. And uh, it's not just that uh, um, unwaged labor is also uh, labor, it is also must be considered as labor. That is what I am trying to, um, to, to understand, no? in what sense we can, we can categorize, we can understand unwaged labor, different kinds of unwaged labors as such. Um, and what, because we, we are lacking theory in this, no? political, we are, we are missing political theory of this because this is uh, it's something that uh, goes um, uh, against common sense and also against a lot of, um, uh, of the classical, also even classic say, Marxist thought. Uh, so this is something that we have to produce anew as a kind of uh, uh, theorization that also must feed into into political praxis. So my own understanding uh, is that uh, of labor is that labor is the subject that uh, uh, produces um, uh, that allows it for the, the the production and development of life on Earth. So both in terms of um, all the work that goes into producing human beings themselves, which is reproductive work and, and, and raising human beings and making them into social beings, that is work. And uh, also feeding human beings, so producing food also, and, um, and all the commodities and the goods and services that are needed uh, for the development of life and, and, on, and of human culture. Okay, so this is very broad. Then, then it's basically everything that is being done is being done by some kind of labor. Um, then it, there is much to it because uh, more to it because we can't consider labor only as a natural human predisposition, or not that we all 
are, as human beings, we need to work to survive. That's not enough. Labor is, to me, is also a relationship. Uh, and it is a relationship to some other subject, to the subject that tends to appropriate this labor in one form or another, capital, the state, power. Uh, so labor to define, um, defining labor, defining the working class to me is a means to understand that labor is not a natural, it's not just a natural fact, it's socially organized. And it's socially organized in a way that tends to uh, uh, um, expropriate part of that uh, to uh, the benefit of some other subject that does not do labor. So this is, is uh, um, what I was mentioning before about um, about working class and racialized women and and and uh, and other people as well who are um, who do reproductive and care work basically because nobody else do it for them because a lot of people can just do away with care work they just pay for it and and so this to me is key to understanding that uh, not everybody can be understood as labor. That labor has an element of necessity on one side, but also an element of, um, of power to it. There are some subjects that leave off the labor of others. So this is key to understanding uh, what we mean by labor. Um, and um, yeah, so, I think this is uh, this is very basic to um, to imagining a labor uh, climate or environmental politics because I think that uh, that the next step is to understand how different kinds of labors, industrial or non-industrial, or what the political ecologist Ariel Saleh calls meta-industrial, all the labor that goes around that is around uh, industrial labor and makes it possible um, and both both formal and informal labor no and um, and wage and unwaged and precarious and these different kinds of labors how are they uh, differently um, affected by environmental uh, change environmental uh, uh, risk or environmental uh, um, damage uh, and also how are they also because this this also influences the way uh, these different subjects um develop an ecological consciousness of of uh, of the environment because through their own experience through their own bodies and their own uh, the way they they work and the way uh they their work is uh, socially organized so this, is, this relates to ecological subjectivity in the sense that uh, depending on the kind of labor that you do in society and who controls that labor and how that labor is organized and what is your place in the social division of labor, depending on that, you develop a different form of understanding of the environment and of environmental problems. And you may also develop different forms of ecological action of mobilization or, or um, um, different forms of uh, um, political uh, mobilization or, or uh, uh, collective mobilization, but even individual mobilization. So um, yeah, I think that uh, I will stop here now and uh, uh, we're here with Derek has to say. Yeah, again, I, I'd agree with all of that. Um to work out together. Um, I mean, I think even if you have a very simplistic misrepresentation of Marxism and the working class, the working class who work in factories are increasingly in Asia and are women. And of course, moving beyond that, as I think we, we'd all say, that you have to repeat um, production and reproduction um, so sometimes people look at marxism and think it's just about exchange values 
but even to have the exchange values, you need what's seen as domestic labour. So I think there's a, a kind of wider mission. And, um, you know, Marxism shouldn't be fossilised or a dogma. I mean, Marxism has always been innovative. Um, you know, so think of, of China and the Chinese Revolution and that being maybe more based on women and, and certainly moving before, beyond the working class to peasants. Um, so I think one figure we should really put back into Marxist history, if we're going to have like a socialist analysis around class and a Marxist analysis, is Lizzie Burns, who of course was Engel's partner. And I always think, well, maybe um, in a sense, Lizzie Burns has produced Mao and Lenin and Trotsky and reformism and revisionism and anti-revisionism. And in some way, it's all come from her. And you know, quite often she's forgotten. So she was Engel's partner, who was an um, Irish factory worker in Manchester, because, of course, Engel's was a family work for capitalist. Um, and I think that a lot of her practice and passion has helped shape, you know, the whole, the whole field of Marxism. Um, so, of course, what Marx and Engels are interesting is like agency and working class agency and how that works. So it's like who's got the radical chains, who can produce an alternative future. Um, and obviously already you have like Lizzie Burns saying to Marx and Engels, and I think she took Engels around Limerick and, you know, kind of enlightened Marx and Engels about the Irish national liberation struggles. And maybe, you know, some the person who prefigures Lenin is James Connolly with the, the 19, you know, 1916 Easter Uprising, which might be seen as very subversive of some people's notions of Marxism. Um, you know, he came from a tradition that, that wasn't looking at national liberation struggles. Perhaps I'm sort of gabbling a little bit, but, um, you know, it's maybe putting Lizzie Burns back in and saying, you know, for eco-socialism and Marxism and, and revolution, who has agency, who has the ability to produce and reproduce change. And maybe always in Marxism, that's been more sophisticated than we might think. Um, so in terms of the, the, the kind of practical politics, um, in Wales, there's the Welsh underground work who are Marxist-Leninists made of, you know, young people. And they're, you know, base building, doing practical work, and this is involving men, women, non-binary people, trans people. But I just think of a small practical thing. They have like a baby bank. So they've like got things for parents, which they collect and help. And okay, there's a problem that mutual aid may not work, but the, you know, sort of concretely, let's think about Lizzie Burns and let's think about political practices, um, which are, you know, have a, have a kind of wider focus. I'll stop there for the moment. Okay, I mean, I, I actually want to um, get more into the um, class struggle dimension in a minute. But before that, since we have been talking about the role of social reproduction, um, um, in your recent book, Stefania, you discussed the concept of earth care labor. Um, can you elaborate on this also, please? Um, and to both of you, so what role can earth care labor play in the context of or against the metabolic rift or in the struggle um, to use it as a leverage uh, for, for, for environmental struggles. Yes, sure. Thanks for mentioning my book. Um, actually, um, what inspired this concept is that two, there's two sources of inspiration for me. First of all, the concept of Earth Air that I took from uh, uh, Carolyn Merchant's uh, work. Uh, Carolyn Merchant, for those who, who don't know, uh, is a um, uh, U.S. environmental historian uh, who is very well known for her book, uh, The Death of Nature, but also she, she, she wrote um, other uh, books, among which one called Earth Care, about women's agency uh, in, uh, in the history of environment and of environmentalism. Um, and so by Earth Care, she refers to uh, women's environmental mobilizations and women's um, agency in environmental movements. Um, but my second source of inspiration 
uh, is actually um, the story, life story of two people who lived and worked in the Amazon uh, region and more specifically in uh, uh, one particular kind of protected area that is called in Brazil, that's called extractive reserve. And that refers a little bit to what Derek was talking about before, the commons. This is a way in which uh, Brazilian uh, environmental law puts together environmental protection and the commons. So the reserves are common property um, uh, land regimes in which uh, people are, um, um, in the people who live there are, are actually also protecting the forest by living there and by making a living out of the forest uh, with the forest as uh, they, they think of it. Um, by non-forest uh, timber, extracting non-forest timber products, that's why they are called extractive reserves, not in the sense of mining, but in the sense of, uh, of taking, um, uh, yeah, of sustainable uh, extraction of, uh, of, uh, of, of forest products. So these people are, that I'm talking about, um, Maria do Espirito Santo and, uh, and the Claudio Ribeiro da Silva were two of the many uh, hundreds and thousands of, uh, um, of um, tens of thousands of, uh, of um, uh, um, uh, people who live in the extractive reserves and protect uh, these, these um, forests with their work. That's what is very interesting to me. That's why I call earth repair as a kind of labor, because uh, it's uh, it's their work is not just a form of subsistence work. Um, it is also the work of uh, uh, um, uh, taking care of the forest by practically being there of and it is protected. Um, and the fact is that these people, uh, so this is what I meant also by earth care work, not only the work of, um, um, you know, of, of women, uh, of women's, uh, women environmentalists, but, but more broadly, the work of uh, reproductive subjects by, in, by which I mean, um, um, the workers in in in reproduction in the reproduction of uh, in reproductive work in the production of of of, uh, of human and non-human life uh, and um, and so this is also um, most of this work is uh, is rural it happens in rural areas it's uh, it have it's been uh, developed by um, by peasants and by people who are um, not practicing industrial farming, but different forms of farming or forestry or fisheries, uh, non industrial, but um, uh, the traditional or subsistence forms um, of farming and forestry and fishery. Um, and at the same time, uh, uh, both history and the history of the commons and also the political ecology of uh, environmental conflicts tell us that these are the, these very uh, uh, earth care workers are also those who are actually protecting, actively protecting um, the, these ecosystems uh, very often against uh, the violence that it, it goes against them. And they are very often um, um, uh, targeted uh, in fact, the two, the two people that I mentioned before were killed, but they are not the only ones. There are every year thousands of earth carers, earth care workers who are killed because they work and their lives stand in the way of uh, capitalist um, extractivism, like the other kind of extractivism. No? Uh, so they stand in the way. And so they are targeted. Um, so for me, uh, this is something, it's very important that we recognize this work. This is a feminist, um, it, sta it starts from a feminist um, approach, rec making visible and recognizing 
those kinds of essential re uh, work, mostly reproductive uh, care work, even if it's not human care, but it's uh, earth care, uh, making this visible and recognizing its importance. Uh, because if you think about it, the, the environmental discourse, the environmentalist, uh, mainstream environmentalist discourse and mainstream environmental politics and global environmental politics uh, hide and silence the existence of these subjects. It's like they never existed. It's like they, this is not, they're not even human. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the mainstream Anthropocene discourse, in the mainstream climate change discourse, when you hear the word humanity, normally it refers to um, Western, the Western civilization and to the Western, to industrial uh, uh, uh, mode of production. It refers to those who are actually harming the environment. But earth care workers are humanity as well. And to me, this means not only a matter of justice, no? and making justice, recognizing the existence of these subjects and their work in protecting uh, the environment, but also uh, it's a matter of hope. Uh, it's for us a matter of uh, uh, realizing that there is hope for humanity because there is in humanity, there is also this capacity, this potential, this potential for human, uh, development with the environment uh, rather than against the environment. So we are told the story that progress comes with destroying the environment. And that's natural. That's nothing we can do about it. It's part of we, what we human beings, what we are. No, but that's not the, the whole story. There is a story of humanity and who we are as human beings in which there is earth care labor. And if we look at that, we understand that uh, we have other potentialities uh, that that still uh, that are still um, uh, worth developing and uh, as as a political project. Thank you. That was so illuminating, um, Derek. Um, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I well, I've I've not. I really must read your book. I'm, I'm ignorant of this, which is a terrible thing to say, but I've not heard of the form of words, earth care work. Um, but I'm certainly familiar with with the practice. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm well aware, and it goes back to what we're saying about um, the idea of a public and environmentalism and an undifferentiated mass and people make demands of the government um you know to recognize that right around the world there are people whose work is to protect the earth and you know there's oil exploration and gas exploration and mining um so what i'm kind of most aware of are the kind of struggles in peru and you know the most important thing or one of the most important one way of conceptualizing climate change action is keeping the oil in the soil and then the people who live in Peru have been very, you know, in the forest have been very effective at, um, you know, extremely politically sophisticated at actually rising up um, and combating oil exploration and gas exploration. And you think of the, the struggles in Ecuador and, and so on. So um, I don't want to homogenize that, um, but, you know, the, the actual keeping the oil and the gas in the soil um and challenging extractivism the people on the ground um do the work so particularly when i did more green party work i did international green party work and i, I don't want to criticize green parties but there's such terrible green parties as well as good green parties and often in, in green politics national green politics they miss the people who are doing the ecological political work um so, you know, I've been lucky enough to have had contact with Hugo Blanco, and I don't know whether people are familiar with Hugo Blanco. Um, so Hugo Blanco um, led a indigenous campesino peasant um, uprising in the 1960s, which was successful and got land rights, um, and then spent most of the 1960s in prison. Um, and what's amazing is he's now like 86, and he's still publishing Lucha Indigena 
and his politics has somewhat changed from kind of Trotskyism to things more like um, Easter's. He's also engaged with Rojava, and his kind of politics, it's you know, it's very much with the earth care, but it's like, you know, um, how can we get involved with indigenous struggles and support those struggles and have solidarity? Um, so one of the nice things, he's done so many really nice things, is um, in Britain, you had workers who were producing wind turbines and the wind turbine factory was being closed and they occupied the factory in the Isle of Wight. And then he sent solidarity to that. And I'm, my wife is some terrible name dropper, but, but this is Ugo Banco. And you can see the curtains because he sat where I am. And it was very poignant because um, he's reading the book, Ten Men Dead, about the hunger strikes in Ireland. And of course, he was often on hunger strike. So though I need to find out more about the earth care concepts, um, I'm, I'm, it, in a, another sense, it's familiar. Um, you know, who, who are the people who are doing the material protecting? Um, rather than this kind of, um, you know, maybe we, um, you're going to hear we're saying, well, no, none of these Marxists believe, nobody's a Marxist believe it's contempt anymore because it's too simplistic. Maybe there are no environmentalists who believe this, that it's just undifferentiated public. Um, although maybe, maybe, sadly, they haven't quite got there. Um, but, you know, as, as has been said, you know, some of the, the people who have got the most fight and are doing the earth care get left out of ecological discourse and again you know i'm thinking of like the, the men and women who are the workers here for our council who look after the trees and all the time we're kind of saying as socialists who are counselors what well, you're the workers you produce what what should we be doing and they'll say things like hey if we replaced all of our equipment which was powered by petrol and diesel um that would reduce emissions and also if we do that and shift batteries then there's less vibration and just this kind of like basic understanding that marxist and ecologists should have that there are workers who do work which cares about the earth and they're they're invisible a lot of the time um, and again if you're going to build and produce and build capacity it's like expecting people and having dialogue which i think sometimes in all forms of politics it's too you know, imposed from groups of people telling other people what to do. Um, yeah, so, so from there, actually, we can, we can go back to the question of class, but into a different aspect of it. So speaking of class struggle and the centrality of class, what is your take on um, class consciousness? Because last week we had a discussion on ecological Leninism and obviously a big thread in Lenin's theoretical as well as practical legacy is to help build political consciousness among or of the working class. Um, Stefania, for instance, uh, you write that the working class has a material or vested interest in the subversion of environmental violence and hence by implication capitalism and that climate change is the newest form or the ter terrain for class struggle. This you link to the notion of ecological class consciousness, but at the same time you speak of contributing to the emergence of this struggle and consciousness, which I guess implies that you do not take the emergence of such consciousness for granted or spontaneous. So can we talk a little about, um, about the uh, consciousness of the working class, the ecological consciousness of the working class, and we can link it to the question of subjectivity, subjectivation, and what role, for example, um, maybe political parties or environmental organizations could have in this context? Yes. Uh... So uh, let me make let me give you an example that make uh, you know make it make it easier to uh, uh, imagine uh, things uh, uh, or related to what I have in mind. When I talk about ecological class consciousness, I think we already have some um, historical examples of uh, the existence of such things, even though that is uh, constantly denied by uh, different kinds of uh, subjects that um, 
pretend to represent ecological consciousness. Uh, in I, I did some um, both research and activism uh, in the in the city of Taranto in southern Italy, where uh, there is the biggest um, steel plant in Europe, steel, steel, uh, steel plant operating steel plant in Europe. Uh, it's called Ilva. It was um, uh, a, a state company uh, built in back in, back in the 1960s, and um, it's um, for a number of historical reasons. This particular plant. This was part of a um, of a complex of uh, uh, of four um, steel uh, uh, steel making uh, districts. In Italy, uh, part of an industrial policy back in the 60s and 70s um, about the industrialization, uh, um, uh, or actually about the self sufficient Italy's uh, self sufficiency in terms of uh, steel uh, and also um, uh, the, the uh, exploitation of. Uh, of iron ore resources on the Italian territory. Anyways, uh, as one of these uh, four poles uh, of four districts, uh, uh, Taranto gradually all the others came uh, reducing their productive capacity uh, during the um, starting in the 70s, also due to the to, um, changes in the international market. But this particular district, it went go actually uh, enlarging. It became bigger and bigger and bigger because basically what happened... I, I cannot hear her at the moment. I cannot hear her at the moment. Do you hear her? Her. Yeah, yeah, I think a connection problem. And it became this sort of a sacrifice. Um, okay, I will meet Stefania for a second and I will write to her. Yes, um, Derek, can you pick it up from here? Um, I mean, you're not supposed to pick it up from where she lives. You can, you can. Yeah, I mean, I, yes, sir. I mean, I, in some ways, I've got a possibly slightly banal point, but I mean, what, what I do feel is there are more environmentalists identifying capitalism as the primary driver of ecological destruction, although not the only one. Um, and my uh, argument, really, getting back to you know what, what you had a couple of weeks ago with, with Jody, I think Kai, is. Um, you know, for anti-capitalist, maybe we need to be looking at Marxism. And, you know, there's a great danger of taking Lenin out of context, but Lenin, um, you know, combined being a theorist and, and had like strong concepts that he used to create revolution. So the sort of starting point is some form of ecological Leninism. Um, and in terms of the kind of how that kind of fits into subjectivities. I mean, I don't always go along with kind of Negre and Hart and autonomous Marxism. I'm not really an autonomous Marxism. It's slightly mysterious and spontaneous, but I know they've got notions from sort of Foucault and Spinoza that as workers, when we produce, we don't just produce commodities, we produce activities. Um, and certainly in a British context, it would be great to have less bad political organizations um, you know, so again, I feel quite modest about this. I always feel inadequate if I'm talking to people from Turkey or Rojava or Kurdistan, that there is a sort of British thing where, you know, British academics have formed whole internationals, completely failed. I think it's about five of them. So I think, in, you know, we need, we need to be modest and, and learn, but certainly in a sort of English context, as well as linking in with like national liberation struggles and Ireland and some which is, is so important how do we get organizations which are less bad not to piss people off and not to demobilize workers so as I say I think 
particularly in a British context, English context, base building is useful because you have community Marxism, you have have organizations, you do mutual trade, aid, you build trust and you build capacity. Um, so what I found is a good model of this, building the subjectivity and organization and capacity building. Capacity building maybe is different from Leninism, but it, it, you've got to build capacity. And the capacity is cultural and subjective and building that kind of capacity. So really inspired by fully socialists in the US as a base building organization who've like built practically, um, you know, have tenants organizations, um, not really got very far with this in England, but in Wales as the Welsh underground. Um, so without reproducing the whole history of Marxism in, in the UK, we've tended to have more Trotskyism. And I think where people have come more from a, you know, kind of Maoism, have you described it, Marxist Leninism, that's a very big topic and there are strengths and weaknesses, but that's had the notion of build the base, serve the people. When people look at what's happening in Rojava or what's happened with Zapatistas in you know, Mexico, in some ways that's a mutation from Marxism and has strengths and weaknesses. But one of the things it's built on from Marxist Leninism is you build the capacity and you build the subjectivities and you build the governance and that's that's part of the mix, whether I've digressed too much. Um, thank you. Actually, my next question will include um, the Zapatistas and Rojava. Stefania, we lost you uh, at some point uh, in the middle of your response. Would yes, you to I'm complete? Sorry. No worries. Yeah. So I just what I wanted to say is that basically what happens in time. <laughs> Burası bir fedakar feda alanı haline geldi. Adalet sermayesinde bu feda alanı olarak tanımlanıyor. İtalya açısından bu son derece İtalya e, ekonomisi açısından bu son derece önemli bir şeydi bu Devasa bir işletmenin e, sorumluluğunun Robert Bullard isimli Afrika Amerikalı bir e, akademisyen. Her insan eşit şekilde kirletilmiyor diye bir ifadede bulundu. Bu harikaydı. Çevresel sorun herkesi etkiledi böylelikle. Vatandaşlar, işçi sınıfı. Sayılar şimdi giderek düştü. Workers in the steel making sector and and and related related sectors. So a huge working class community that they became aware of this this this environmental inequality and unequal exposure to industrial hazards being related to their class position, to their uh, being a working class community and, uh, uh, and how this affected their health and uh, the health of their children and the whole community, not only the workers working at uh, ILBA, but the whole community because environmental pollution is so widespread and uh, unmanageable because of the, of the scale. No? So they started to mobilize against that. And what happened was that the trade unions uh, were actually, uh, they were just denying that. They were not interested in pursuing uh, an ecological class 
politics. They were just going on and on with same old kinds of uh, um, um, yeah, wage-based and wage-related uh, issues, which of course are uh, tradi what traditional trade unions do, but, but historically there is also some important uh, work that trade unions have done in the protection of environmental and public health and starting from occupational health, from the health of the workers. But, you know, that was not something that uh, the Italian trade unions were willing to, to, to pursue. And what this, uh, so, so this, this ecological clash consciousness arising from the workers and the citizens of Taranto was being denied by those who should have um, um, represented it no? and, make, and made it into, uh, into, um, um, into the political mobilization. So this created you know, a splitting consciousness and the, the community of Taranto is a highly divided community. There is a, you know, a, it's split at the core uh, because there are still, there is this denial that, that uh, public health and environmental health are actually part of, uh, of class politics. Uh, and there are those who still believe so and they mobilize in this sense, but there are, there are a lot of people who actually deny that and you know and, and they basically are you know this creates a division that is uh, also um, um, blocking the potentiality the possibilities of uh, of, uh, of of um, of class politics which are always based on unity of the working classes so this division of the working classes is a highly functional basically to uh, maintenance of the status quo. So this is the dilemma that I see in Taranto. Uh, you, can, you can see it more broadly as a, you know, as a metaphor of, of, uh, of what also Derek, if I understood, was also talking about that before, uh, of this lack of unity uh, due to uh, the, you know, uh, not incapacity of the traditional left at recognizing uh, uh, ecology as part of class politics, but also, of course, there are, yeah, uh, I totally agree that there are uh, new possibilities uh, and new potentialities emerging with, uh, with the Zapatistas, which, which is not as new, actually, <laughs> uh, and with the, uh, and with Rojava that are, you know, uh, things that uh, give us hope uh, of overcoming this kind of um, uh, yeah, divisive. Div Oops, I think we lost her again, but I think her answer was almost complete. I assume, yeah, she's here. Okay, thank you, Stefania. That's it's it's really helpful to uh, learn in more detail about uh, concrete, practical cases in other parts of the world. Which my next question actually will be linked to. So you both focus on the importance of commons in your research. Derek, you have a book, actually two books, on this issue. Uh, so can you both tell us a bit about how uh, the practice of commoning constitutes a response, as well as an alternative to the both inequalities brought about by capitalism and um, a, a bringing about a systemic uh, alternative if it, if it promises to do so. Also, do you think um, there are limitations um, of the concept of commons and the practice of commoning? Um, if so, what are these? And last but not least, we can link these um, to the practical uh, concrete examples of Rojava and Chiapas, um, what would you say in this respect? What what do we have to learn from them, as well as what are what are the potential uh, shortcomings or the limitations of these models? Shall I start on that? Sure. I I need probably about a month to answer that. Um, 
but I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I mean, I think I think there's various ways of contextualizing commons in terms of ecology. Um, so if we think of the sort of environmental debate about the so-called tragedy of the commons from Garrett Harding, that quite often commons was contextualized as a problem and that you've got unowned forests and whatever and people will wreck them. And in some ways that sort of anti-commons politics, I will be talking about this for hours, I'll have to try and be, be briefer, you know, is kind of rooted in imperialism and British imperialism and needing to control people and the commons is used as a justification for very heavy handed state control as a sort of extractivist project and kicking people off the land for conservation. And it's also a way of commodifying. So maybe, you know, the, the, the commons is sort of prior and the real problem is it's the anti-commons. So what I think was useful about kind of Eleanor Ostrom's I mean, frankly, assault on Harding, although she wouldn't have in this way, um, is that it's really challenging this idea that you need the anti-commons and you need to commodify everything. Um, so the, there are many kind of Ellen Rostrum stories, and I don't know how much you know about her, in many which is coming very much from kind of methodological individualism and liberalism problems. Um, but she was teaching at the, um, you know, in Indiana and Garrett Harding, because the tragedy of the commons was the, you know, most cited scientific paper, even though it was really scientific. And he turned up at um, Bloomington campus and said, uh, the whole problem is population and you should sterilize, you know, couples if they've had one child. And it, this is the source of ecological problems. And Eleanor got up and said, well, isn't this totalitarian and authoritarian and wrong? Um, and he said, no, I have a theory to prove it. It's the tragedy of the commons. And then she thought about, hey, what she'd been doing um, with Vint, a partner and their, um, their whole network, which is interesting because somebody quite from individual, methodological individualism, the much better than most of us who are Marxist scholars was always very collective. So her development of the fact that the commons um, can be maintained and can thrive, and that if you deepen democracy, and of course this fits in with the earth care, is a way of like challenging this kind of right-wing anti-commons view that leads to so much oppression and commodification. Um, but she is saying there's the potential for environmental damage. So what she did, of course, was to look at lots of case studies through the social science and the natural science and say, how can commons work better or worse? What do people do on the ground? So I think that's tremendously useful in terms of um, you know, anti-capitalism, um, though that wasn't her project at all. Um, it's so poetic that she, her Nobel Prize lecture was on economics beyond the market and the state, and to actually have some kind of theorization of that. You know, it's the way that kind of Spinoza's critique of the Bible produces a new religion, but her looking at all the silences in the market and anti-market economics opens up a whole space of anti-capitalist economics. Um, I should try and be concise, which I'm very bad at in the commons, and I'll, I'll talk hours on Austin, she have to shut person of you know, inspiration and charm um you know it fits in doesn't it with the notion of earth care because you've got commonly managed forests and so on and so forth and they need defending and they're not the problem their solution if we're talking about prosperity without growth decommodification social sharing so on give us the basis of a prosperous life which is ecological um the kind of problems with this is often her stuff is misread. She would say commons a solution for everything. And that you need a dimension of, you know, revolutionary Marxist politics, I would say, and Leninism, because what she wasn't so great at was looking at the power dynamics and class and how things were being stolen from people. And also you can't just pose commons 
as something which is very broad, where I think she was very strong, is you have to look at the micro politics and sociology of the commons and what works and what doesn't work. Um, so there are two commoners, aren't there? There's like Ostrom, um, you know, who looked at a lot of the micro, and then maybe three commoners or four commoners, Mark Dillingles and Lizzie Burns, who were saying the real tragedy of the commons, talking the English commons and, and, and Engels with the German commons, is it's just been stolen from people. So you need those elements of the micro and how you build trust and operation and manage the commons and fit them into polycentric system. And then you also need to make revolution or your commons would be stolen. And, and I'd love to get onto Rajava, but possibly that, that's enough for me for the moment. Thanks, Derek. I think my, uh, my, I think, uh, yeah, Eleanor Ostrom, you're completely right. It's been very important for the uh, whole, um, you know, rediscovery of the commons as something that has, uh, is related not only to um, um, society, no, and to anti-capitalism, but it's also related at the same time to the earth. To, to different ways of relating to the earth. I want to give a concrete uh, historical example of that. And to me, which has a lot to do with, uh, with class politics and with, uh, with the workers and uh, the history of, uh, uh, of labor. And that example is that of the Robert Tuffer's um, movement. The Robert Tuffer's in the Brazilian Amazon, again, um, the rubber tappers uh, uh, were back in the in the eighties. Um, group of workers who were uh, working for landowners, so they were wages workers uh, working in carving, uh, extracting uh, latex from the trees. Uh, but they were doing this for the landowners for a wage, they were uh, super exploited and um, in a very unequal uh, land property regime and uh, also in, uh, in a very com complicated relationship with indigenous people in the same area. Uh, with, uh, with the politics of uh, class division, the landowners were establishing hierarchies between uh, indigenous uh, people working also for them and uh, non-indigenous workers um, uh, with with the idea of keeping these two populations of workers divided. So what happened back in the in the eighties was that um, a movement emerged uh, that was at the same time a rubber tappers union. That's how they called themselves. They called, they were they saw themselves as a union um, uh, struggling for not just for uh, the wage or the labor rights, but actually struggling against land, uh, the private, private property of the land, of the forest. And this movement, um, uh, this struggle was successful. This is one very, uh, uh, of very few historical examples of um, uh, struggles for the commons who have been uh, successful and made into uh, law and, and made into reform, actual reform, uh, and recognized by the by the uh, by the Brazilian constitution. And how is that possible that a bunch of rubber tappers, very poor people, in working in the in the Amazon in very difficult conditions in the, the Amazon forest? How could they be so successful the, through a politics of alliance? First of all, with the indigenous population. So the first political move was that of overcoming the um, division uh, that the landowners had established and allying with the indigenous people. And on the basis of what? On the basis of a common struggle for the commons. Um, for the forest, for uh, claiming the forest as a commons. Um, 
and it's after this alliance that it actually created a larger movement called the Alliance of Forest Peoples. Uh, this larger movement, uh, including both indigenous people and the Rappers, Rappers Union, um, also allied with the international environmental um, environmental uh, organizations, the international environment, uh, environmental uh, community, and um, because of the importance, the relevance of the Amazon region, no? that in those same years it became important, it became uh, clear how the Amazon was uh, seen as a global commons, no? a commons that was important also for the planet, for, for planet Earth in its entirety. So this gained attention from people outside the region and also with the academic community. So there were academics in Brazil that started to support this movement and uh, claim that this movement was right in, in all uh, its, um, and support them also uh, by elaborating this political proposal uh, that that make a law, uh, the proposal of the extractive reserve. And that's how the extractive reserves were born. These were not, this not came, this did not came out of some enlightened uh, legislator. They came out of, social movement struggle. Um, so so this, my, this is my example is that, that I really care about because this is an example of uh, how the um, class alliances are key to, um, the, to a class politics of the environment. No? Alliances between wages workers, the rubber sappers, non-wages workers, the indigenous population, and um, the environmental uh, um, uh, movements um, and academia, and to me, is the the, the knowledge, the, the producers and reproducers of knowledge that are legitimized by the system. No, so uh, all these alliances made it possible uh, for these uh, social movement claims to uh, become uh, politically um recognize and make a difference in the history of uh, of the of the of the working classes and the history of the environment at the same time through the recognition of of uh, uh of the amazon forest as a commons so yeah that's that's the example that i think we should uh, always keep in mind when when we speak about this um, thanks so much. Um, I see someone is raising their hand, but um, I will um, ask them to please write their question into the chat and uh, our friends will basically communicate the question to me, which I will ask here. And there's already one question uh, from the audience, which I want to combine with another question of mine and make it into a mega question. So, uh, so the question is, okay, taking commons as point of departure, like, um, as, as the basis for an alternative economy. Um, now the question is going to be, let's go back to the 20th century and socialism. And um, in line with the majority of the degrowth literature, Stefania, you argue that uh, socialist regimes of the 20th century were also marked by taking growth as an overarching goal or basically succumbing to the imperative of growth. So let's elaborate on this a little bit, because um, I understand where this critique is coming from and, and partially share it when it comes to, for example, the Soviet Union. Um, I think the belief, the conviction to beat capitalism on its own turf, which became such a central theme, political em emphasis in the second half of the 20th century, especially, was disastrous as it reduced the content of socialism basically to a quantitative contest with capitalist production, uh, where qualitative differences, alienation, an increase in free time, uh, the socialization surplus got more and more out of sight. But at the same time, I think most Western authors, um, or let me put it this way, most writers whose knowledge of the Soviet Union relies on Cold War influenced and most of the time anti-communist literature are too quick to establish like 
a certain formal equivalency between socialism and capitalism, that they were equally bad when it comes to environmental degradation, that they were equally responsible for the nuclear arms race or militarization for that matter. I think this narrative obscures the historical context within which the first socialist regimes tried to survive. Uh, literally all of them found themselves under constant military siege and um, invasion threats, internal sabotage and coup attempts and so forth. So long story short, I think like saying that socialism and capitalism were equally bad when it comes to environmental degradation is a historically um, questionable. And um, for example, there's a very good book by Salvatore Engel di Mauro, um, a recent book, which demonstrates using a cold and clear eye that, of course, socialist regimes had a lot to be criticized in terms of their um, environmental performances. But at the same time, uh, there was a qualitative difference between them and the capitalist world. And B, I think we miss many pieces of the puzzle which are required for a complete understanding of the historical circumstances within which they had to operate and survive in the first place. So I think a very important piece of the puzzle turns out to be the almost impossibility of coexistence with capitalism due to the military and economic and political aggression of the latter, which imposes sort of a path dependency. I would say. Now, let's link this back to the question at the beginning, um, the, the, namely the question of whether or not commons or any other tool in this respect represent the basis for an alternative economic system and how they can be implemented on a global scale. I think at this particular moment in history, we definitely have to think globally, or at least part of our mind has to be globally oriented. And if this implementation requires different tools and avenues of transition, such as state capacity, state power, and so forth. I know this is a giant question, so you can pick whichever aspect of it um, you like and uh, relate to it. Shall I go first, or? Sure. Yeah, um, I'm really agreeing with what you talked about, what was described as actually existing socialism. And then I think you posed a question which is so profound and difficult, I can't answer it. Well, I'm mainly just talking about the stuff I agree with you. And yeah, it used to be very much in the ecological movement. And, you know, maybe I should be brief about this because people are into my views, whether or not you, you are. I've written this imperialism is the arsonist having stolen the title from Thomas Sankara, and I get into this. And obviously, what should be emphasized is environmentalists, it would always be capitalism and communism. They're all part of the same thing. And uh, we got the Blu-ray of the Chernobyl and, you know, the Aerial Sea and, um, you know, there are a number of things that we can talk about this. I mean, obviously, you can look at Trotsky grinding down mountains and then Mao and the war on sparrows and then, you know, damn the whole kind of Marxist project. But, um, you know, I think with the Marxist project, even within, you know, have we described existing socialism or pre-existing socialism? There's a lot of ecology as well. You think of like Lenin and natural parks and bears, and you think of all of the really great stuff in Cuba. And we might go, well, in terms of states, Fidel was the first person involved with the state really to, you know, really to kind of have an ecological challenge. So there are resources within Marxism and obviously all the ecological stuff in Marx and Engels. Um, there also is the kind of path dependency, but I think there's a danger of like an idealist politics where you pose these people have done these things in a terrible way and we could do things in a good way, which of course the English left always do and never get anywhere. So it's a little bit like debates about anarchism, but anarchists would say, you know, we think it all went wrong with the Bolshevik revolution, and criticise Lenin and Stalin, but there are particular things, I know there was the quite controversial but um, interesting article on the Makhno movement in Ukraine, you had anarchists doing things that might be wrong. Because you have very, very difficult circumstances. And, you know, the most fundamental thing I would say with communism is for the communism to survive. And, you know, I'm anti-productivist, 
Um, you know, I'd criticise a lot of the stuff that happened in the Soviet Union, but wow, um, what would have happened if they hadn't done some of this and they'd been defeated by the Nazis? Um, you know, Hegel always said human history isn't a theatre of happiness. Mm -hmm. I think there's like critique, there's looking at how circumstances shape things. Um, you know, we could certainly criticise Mao. I think that's very, very useful. But Stalin stuff was stupid and oppressive, and that's and that's the stuff of the sparrows is you know a myth and the kind of trotsky stuff you know is very problematic but we need some nuance um i think in terms of how you work globally that's tough um but you know as a slight thing i'd say you've got the idea of polycentric systems nostrum which you really theorize that you have some things that are produced globally and we have global institutions but basically they're sort of mutated us institutions so you build your commons into regions and there are various um different um institutions that interact often in messy ways so i've never actually tracked down and read mao's invisible hand because mao is so contradictory but this argument um you know for, i think from possibly quite mainstream economists who would say the fact that in china through the guerrilla struggles, you had to have more sensitivity, which was local, has actually given China more resilience. So, um, you know, I haven't got a, a kind of blueprint for this, but obviously you need polycentric systems. Um, you know, we need to have the kind of debates on socialist planning and be honest about the problems of socialist planning, but we probably can't get rid of it. And we need commons as part of the mix. So I think one of the ways in which Ostrom is misunderstood, he didn't say commons are a panacea or it wasn't anti capitalist. And I think the danger of having some sort of a, like a psychoanalytical thing that you have, you know, Zizek, who's generally terrible, talks about the symptom, something that we hate, that we can blame everything on. But there's also maybe the anti symptom. I don't know, I'm not an enough Lacan, but this, we invest all our emotional and political energies if we just did this one thing, that would solve everything. And sometimes the commons people invest all of their energies in it and see it as a panacea. Uh, but I'm a sort of broken clock, really saying, read Ostrom, act on what they do in a different context. They're open thinkers. I wouldn't quite say they're all we need, but they're a very useful start. And I should get back on Rajava at some point, which is important. Stefania, would you like to relate to the question? Yes, yes, of course. And I just, first of all, let me say that my computer's battery is almost dead. So I might fade away at some point and I apologize for that. Uh, I, let me just say that I think Saed, Salvatore, Di Mauro did a wonderful work and much needed because uh, beyond what was uh, re repeated by everyone, we actually we were actually lacking studies, research about what was what, what actually happened in socialist states and uh, and environmental politics. So. I am reading the book right now. I haven't finished yet, so I won't go into the, the issue in detail. I'm willing to change my position once I, I will finish the book and uh, consider what Salvatore is claiming. But in any case, the point I wanted to make is that, um, first of all, we can't equate state socialism with the commons, of course, uh, they're not the same thing. And state socialism is not even the same as a democratic confederalism or as a, uh, the Zapatista um, uh, project. So they are different things. And even, between, even within state socialism, there are, of course, different um, historical uh, um, uh, and geographical experiences. So I think that what we uh, we need to know much more about it, to do much more research, and to be much much more uh, to go, you know, to have more details. But um, I think that for me, what is really important is that you cannot impose the commons uh, on, on onto people. People have uh, the commons is something that can be only struggled for. People have to claim the commons. And uh, because the commons are a lot of work, it's not you know a romantic thing. It's hard work, 
and uh, it requires a lot, not only the work of uh, managing and maintaining the commons, but also the work of, of, of agreeing and of, of making a community of commoners and of on agreeing on the rules and having the rules respected by everyone and uh, also changing the rules as a, as a, as a need be. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of work that not all people are willing to do. A lot of people want to be governed. Uh, they want some, to have some authority who is in charge of things. And, um, and you know, so, so commons, uh, I think this is something that, uh, that also Elena Nordstrom said, commons are not a panacea for everything. Uh, it's important for us to recognize that they must emerge from, uh, from a, a, a community of uh, uh, struggling and claiming uh, the commons. And this is actually happening. This is always happening uh, all through the, the history of capitalism is actually uh, um, crossed uh, through by the history of commoning struggles all the way down from, from the beginning of capitalism to today. So it's not like uh, this is not happening. It's just that it cannot be uh, centrally planned and imposed. That's my um, that's my position about about it. Thanks so much. Um, I think the the person who wanted to ask the question wants to quote from a book, so they want to read it. Um, they could unmute themselves um, if they want to raise the question now. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Iksan uh, from Climate Justice Coalition, uh, Turkey. So um, we have a group called uh, Ecoside Working Group, and I'm also an Ecoside Turkey. So we have a kind of um, network, uh, international network, we're working together. So I'm reading on uh, Ecoside. Uh, books uh, on this issue, which one of them is uh, very recently published by David White. Um, just if you, if I can see it. its name is uh, Kill the, I'm sure you're gonna love it. Uh, Kill the corporations before it kills, they kill you, uh, it says. And um, right from the beginning of the, the, the opening of the book uh, says that uh, in, 19 in, in 1970s and 1980s, uh, there had been some uh, political activism and uh, there, just, I need to quote that one, please. If I can turn it all around. I'm looking at the iPad and, and, and the telephone. Yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, it says, um, there was a um, arms, arms corporation called Lucas Aerospace, okay? And there the workers uh, were fed up with their skills, I'm quoting at the moment, uh, fed up with their skills being used to produce weapons. Uh, and therefore they uh, developed to, to, to get rid of it, they developed prototypes of a number of socially useful technologies and and the the book goes on with uh the lucas plan they call it the lucas plan uh and it says that it has been somehow not understood well and not supported well by the government and by public and uh that has to be and this experience uh, lived by the workers and lived by the industry should be kind of um, maybe um, retransferred or maybe remodeled, you know better, you know better than me, and uh, should be dusted off, so to speak, and reused, it, it says. I'm just reading on. I have not get down to the end of the book. 
So it seemed to me like that um, there are some solutions popping up all around the world and England is included so far. And uh, it seems like to me, I mean, you know better um, that some, a different way of looking at all of the issues and all of our human resources and even the industries uh, and a different reorganizing uh, them all can somehow uh, help us sort out the tackle of the climate problem that looks enormous to us. Maybe it is not. I mean, um, trusting that, I mean, if, if I asked you from, the, from a place that you have no information about i can understand that i'm not i'm not british i have no history with with these people other than reading them but if you can comment on that it it kind of gives me some hope uh, right so what do you think i mean can it be possible or if you have any ideas about it Shall I go first? Shall I, I respond briefly? Oh, sorry. Maybe, maybe Stefania can go oh, first yeah, because yeah, yeah. she might run out of her battery. So yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. of course, yeah. <laughs> no, yes. I just wanted to say briefly, of course, thanks for mentioning the Lucas plan. That's absolutely one of the uh, key examples that give us hope about the capacity of industrial labor, not just the meta-industrial or reproductive labor, but industrial labor itself. Uh, workers who are positioned at the core of the industrial mode of production, their capacity and potential for ecological revolution. So to me, that gives a lot of hope because it means that we don't need to go back uh, to get rid of industry in itself uh to be uh ecological we can do things differently even industrial things uh differently right if we uh are uh, aware of the potential uh that labor has at doing things differently once it gets rid of capital and uh of other forms of uh, um um uh, imperialism, for example, or patriarchy, or uh, or um, uh, uh, human supremacy, speciesism. No? So once you get freed of these forms of mastering that actually um, inhibit the potential, the capacity of labor, the ecological potential of labor, then you have you can have a different way. A different uh, you can have a di different ways of doing things even industrial things uh so the problem is not industry in itself but it, it's the mastering logics that uh um that control industry Derek? yeah i'm very familiar being english with the lucas plan and it was in the 70s or 80s so it's a real bit of inspiration um, and I was going to say, I mean, we're not, I think in some countries around the world and there's terrible human rights problem, but we are going to have a lot of democracy in Britain. <laughs> we're English, we probably complain about things and don't feel we have very much to say. Um, so the fact that something isn't taken up by the English government is unsurprising because we have a succession of appalling governments. Um, but I think the Lucas plan was really important. I think it fits in with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, but if you have a gas transition, it's got to be based on the workers. So things like Lucas Plan and in Australia, the green bands where the Builders Workers Union were mobilising and not building things for trans people were really core. Cool. It's just going to flag up being sort of semi-academic books like um, Mackenzie Walk. Um, that seems to be one of the things that she's got quite core in her theory about she looks at various like marginal, you know, forgotten Marxist theorists like Bogdanov and so on. Um, I think often I wouldn't agree with her about Lenin and Stalin, but she's very talks about workers and new forms of knowledge and how those can produce ecology. 
Um, it's just how we build the capacity um, to overthrow capitalism or even, even reform things. You know, that seems to be the... So, yeah, things like the Lucas Plan are tremendous inspiration and to avoid ecocide, a big element of it comes from the workers and how they produce differently. Um, but it's how we produce a whole different society, which is, is maybe the very difficult challenge. I might have some dinner in a minute, but you probably don't mind if I have some dinner and keep talking, do you? Oh, sure. I mean, actually, um, I think we can we can stop at this point. We're, we're done with questions. Again, Stefania and Derek, thank you both so much. This was very, very informative for us. Um, and I think it was the longest seminar <laughs> we've had so far. Oh, I think we lost Stefania. Oh, she's here. Okay. Thank you so much. Could, could I interrupt you and mention Rujava? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That, you, you know, I, I mean, Java is so much in our hearts and it's been so important. And um, I think you can get a lot of green politics from Machiavelli and he talks about being prepared for floods and so on and Fortuna, although in an unfortunately sexist way. And he also talks about all unarmed prophets have failed and the armed prophets have succeeded. And, you know, the, the people in Rojava, you know, armed with ideas and also armed with arms, you know, have been strong enough to build something. And I'm, I'm not, you know, Bookchin, I, I think Bookchin was great in many ways. Though I found it a little bit sectarian, although that's not the experience of Rojava. And I ident identify more with the, the sort of an Innis organisation in Rojava. Rojava is such a fantastic inspiration. And we need to learn from it and give it solidarity and be aware of the kind of all on Rojava from Turkey. Yeah, there. so much. Uh, maybe we can have one separate session uh, one day on Rojava. That would be great. Um, once again, thank you so much, both of you. Um, this was very informative. And I have to, again, remind myself to thank our great interpreters uh, today, Mugay Bahadur and Barish uh for helping uh this happen um and um take care um have a great rest of your days um so thanks so much and thank you for organizing this and thanks derek uh, for this uh nice uh, conversation and and everybody for being here and i just I also want to uh, thank my husband who's driving me all the way through <laughs> this conversation. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, please pass him also our thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have to, have to thank all of you and thank you, my wife, my wife Emily, who's cooking. So that's otherwise something, you know, I thought we're about you. Thank you so much. And as I said, the Bye. struggles in Rojava and Turkey and so on are so much in our hearts. So thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a great day. Bye.